evil altars. Evil altars. We'll start with Genesis 28, 11. On reaching a certain place, he spent the night there because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones from that place, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And Jacob had a dream about a ladder that rested on the earth with its top reaching up to heaven. And God's angels were going up and down the ladder. And there at the top, the Lord was standing and saying, I'm the Lord, your God, and your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you now lie. So we know the rest of the story from Genesis 28, that Jacob then established an altar there. He named the place Bethel, and he agreed that God would be his God, and he would give him an offering of a tenth. But I want to talk about altars today. I want to talk even about We'll mention some good altars, but we'll mention evil altars as the subject matter because we need to know what evil altars are doing in our lives and we need to be able to recognize these things. And we also are going to pray some fire prayers, yes, at the end to see if we can get rid of these evil altars out of our lives. Amen. So an altar is a raised structure. And I'm just describing something that might be in a church. It's a raised structure, a place where sacrifices are, all, are offered, like um, the Holy Communion is there in your church, if you have that in your church. Or it is some other type of altar, like in the Old Testament, a raised platform of stone or some other material where incense is burned and worship is held um, unto the Lord. That is the original use and the original call for an altar. From the Bible okay so but altars are there to invite or invoke the presence of God and then we as humans we get answers to our prayers quicker if we are near the altar or at the altar of God and so the altar then empowers and activates covenants just as we read about Jacob God and Jacob making a covenant there in Genesis 28. So the altar empowers and activates covenants, but it also these covenants in this altar keeps working into the generations. And we see patterns in the lives of people who are under covenant. And we all are under some type of covenant, evil or godly, hopefully godly. And these patterns keep repeating in our lives to the positive or to the negative, depending on what covenant it is and what type of altar is uh, emanating these blessings or cursings out to us in the name of Jesus. So nowadays, I don't know, some of you may not even know what I'm talking about when I mention a church altar, because many churches don't even have altars these days. They have stages, you know, for entertainment. But anyway, altars should be in churches and they should be kept holy it is a sanctified table or a sanctified place and it is kept holy so the spirit of god and the host of heaven can descend and visit using this altar as a as a touch point as an interface during the service as it were so signs and wonders can confirm the word that's coming forth in that church amen an altar can also be invisible. We'll go into a little bit more about this later in this same message. So God intended that altars are made. God made had Abraham to make him an offer where he established covenant with Abraham. He, uh, When Noah got off the ark, Noah made an altar to God as thanksgiving uh, for, I'm sure, landing that big boat. Okay, But Satan is a copycat, and so he is a great deceiver. So he has altars also. So I want to talk about altars, about active altars or how they become active. They become active with sacrifices, offerings. So an active altar has a power to bless or curse, kind of like a volcano. They speak, altars speak, and they can speak into generations. They go on for years and years, centuries even. They don't, it's not just a one and done. You hear me say that a lot. Altars can speak negatively or they can speak positively. An altar can speak in your absence, even if you're not there, or it can speak in your presence as well. Because there are spirits or there is a spirit or there are spirits associated with an altar. 
You can look this up in Revelation 16, 7. But evil altars project and they send out generational curses, for example. And this gives the demons access to the foundation of a man, foundations of a family, of a bloodline. But no altar will speak without a sacrifice or an offering. So evil altars speak to the demons that are there invoked to cause to come and cause negative things to happen to a person or family or bloodline. And so the godly altars do, of course, the godly things, the things that we want. They send blessings to a person, to a family, to a bloodline. Amen. Altars can be seen or unseen. They are doors or portals as they were, as, as it were, to the spirit realm. They're like the highways for angelic traffic. Recall Jacob saw ladder angels descending and ascending from this ladder that is from the natural into the spirit and back and forth to bring blessings from God to Jacob or in the case of an evil altar, sometimes they bring curses into the life of people, a person, a family or bloodline, even a whole community or territory. So uh, we'll let's uh, review it. On reaching a certain place, Jacob spent the night there and he had a dream about a ladder that rested on the earth and its top reached up to heaven and God's angels were going up and down the ladder. So you see an altar empowers and activates covenants and these patterns, as I say, they repeat down bloodlines. They repeat in families, negative or positive. Uh, you can probably look at your family and say, oh, these great things keep happening. This has happened to this one and this one and this one. I don't know. They get married. They have great families. This one gets married. They have a great family. This one gets married. They have a great family. That's your bloodline. Praise God. In some families, nobody gets married. In some families, nobody has kids. In some families, there's poverty. In some families, there's uh, their housing issues. In some families, there are curses. In some families, their blessings. It depends on what altar that family has covenanted with. And you might say, what covenants? Well, God said over and over in the Old Testament, he said, build me an altar. Build me an altar right here and put thus and so on it. And in the case of Jacob, he says, I'm going to give you and your descendants the land right here on where you're lying. And your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and they will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, God is saying, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Altars or where covenants are established. And ideally you want to make covenant with God. But let's go back to Genesis 1 where Abel, um, the book of Genesis where Abel and Cain, Cain and Abel were to bring offerings to the Lord. And Abel did just what God told him to do. He did it just the way God told him to do it. And God accepted it. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and that was good. So whatever is put on an altar is going to draw something. It's going to draw something good or bad. It's going to draw God, something godly, the angels of God, or it's going to draw evil. And then once it draws that, it creates this covenant. And then this covenant then projects out what the covenant says it should project out. That is more of the same. It'll reflect more of the same, either a blessing or it'll reflect and project out a cursing based on what was placed on that altar and who it was intended for. So the intent and the purpose of the altar has a strong bearing on who's going to be invoked, what kind of entity is going to come, and then what kind of covenant will be established and what kind of blessing or cursing is going to happen down a family, down a bloodline, into the generations, into centuries of that family. Because an altar of God is not going to just project evil. That's not how that works. Now, an evil altar could temporarily reflect a counterfeit blessing that's just to confuse and entrap the person. Because basically, an evil altar 
sends out evil. It sends out evil arrows, evil patterns, sorrows, loss, tragedy, grief. But at God's altar, God sends out blessings, all the blessings of Abraham and all the blessings. You can read them in Deuteronomy 28. But in the book of Malachi in chapter one, God is accusing Israel and the priests therein of bringing him blemished offerings. He says, when you bring blind animals for sacrifice, isn't that wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or deceased, diseased animals, isn't that wrong? You see, inferior sacrifices do not please God. And you can't trick God anyway. So you put, if somebody puts a, a, an inferior or contaminated, polluted offering on an altar, even if it's God, God's altar, well, who do you think is going to come running for that? Remember, Abel's offering was good. Let's talk for a second about Cain's offering because Cain's offering did not please God. Cain, if we go back to that passage, I won't call it out here. We know where it is. It says in the process of time, Cain brought his offering. And this offering did not please God because of what it was. And I think in the process of time was part of the problem too. But the, in the heart, the intent of man is part of this offering. That's why God says in the New Testament, be a cheerful giver. So if you don't do something if you end up doing something that you really don't want to do it and you do it with a heavy heart or you're uninvolved, you're aloof and you're not cheerful about it, that's not pleasing to God. So in the case of Cain and in the process of time, that's procrastination. In the process of time is procrastination. Procrastination is like rebellion and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You can hear more on this message uh, in the message called In the Cool of the Day on this channel. It's one of the first ones that we posted on this channel. But Abel did just as he said he would do. So we, in order to honor God, we need to let our words and our deeds match. So we're not hypocrites. So we're not liars. So we let our yes be yes and our no be no. Matthew 5, 37, let your yes be yes and your no be no for whatever is more of these is from the evil one. So here's this altar. And if I bring a trifling offering to God and God doesn't accept it, is it just going to lay there? Well, in the natural, if you paid your electric bill, but the electric company doesn't accept it, you'd be sitting in the dark, right? You need to bring the required something to the required place at the required time. Because if you don't bring the required offering to God, for instance, perhaps the power that God gives you to conduct your life, to live and move and have your being is interrupted. And now you're open season for the devil. But how many of us know if or when or how many times our ancestors displeased God in any way? In tithes, offerings, deeds, actions, words. And maybe they didn't repent. Because when soulish and devilish and evil covenants and contracts are made, they don't just end with the person that made them. Unless that person repented, renounced, broke the covenant, broke the curse, bound the demons and that were enforcing the curse, then those covenants could still be working from evil altars to this very day in the lives of that man's generations. And this is foundation. This is the foundation and it's in the foundation now of that bloodline. And any of us could have inherited such a thing. Lord have mercy. So here's this altar. And so if I bring this trifling offering to God, God doesn't accept it. It's just there. Well, an offering is a seed and the devil loves seed. He always runs for seed like an evil bird. So right now, I haven't even talked about the building of an evil altar. I'm still talking about a godly altar that's being disrespected. Trifling altars. I mean, it's a good offer, but trifling offerings. Blemished, inferior, improper, wrong offerings, no offerings. That defiles and profanes the altar. I mean, you can't even take useless bad stuff to goodwill they're going to refuse it they'll put it right back in your vehicle and give it to you or they'll take it and throw it in the trash dumpster right in front of you so how are you going to bring a jacked up offering or no offering to god well that's idolatry because you're keeping the best stuff for yourself 
You're making yourself into the idol. And look what happened to Cain. I mean, sure, Cain had some better stuff. Did he use it up already? Did he just decide to hoard it and keep it for himself? So Cain was marked. We'll talk about evil marks in another message. We've got a lot more to go in this one. And then there was Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron. Aaron was the priest. But Nadab and Abihu, his sons, offered strange fire unto the Lord, and God killed them. God can call any number of things defiled because God wants things a certain way. God likes purity, pure stuff. He doesn't like things defiled, polluted, contaminated, profaned, or anything inferior. That's not what he gives you. That's not what he gives me. And you don't even want your stuff jacked up like that. You're not even God. You like your stuff nice. Your food needs to be prepared a certain way, presented a certain way. Your clothes look nice. Your hair, your car, your house. Everything is a certain way for you. God has that right to demand order. Amen. God even tells man how to build the altar. You know, he's God. He's got it like that. Exodus 20 and 25. He says, if you make an altar of stone for me, you don't put out, put any cut stones in it. For if you wield your tool on it, it will profane it. And here we are, mankind, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. And we don't wait until, if we can help it, till we're all beat up, run down, torn up, half dead to drag ourselves in to present ourselves a living sacrifice to God. We need to be lively stones. We need to present ourselves when we are good to God. So he will be well pleased with what we're bringing him. But still coming to God later is better than not coming to God at all. Thank you, Lord. So we don't bring contrary things and perverse things and perverse people and defile the sacred altar of God. Or else that gives Satan and his evil host opportunity to jump in it. Because the devil comes not. But to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? John 10, 9. So he comes to put people in spiritual bondage. In perpetual slavery. If he can. If there's an opening. So we don't bring damaged, inferior, trashy, wrong, profane, polluted offerings to God. It is an insult and an abomination to the Lord. And I want to insert just a small warning here to the youth and the ignorant. People who want to reinvent things that don't need to be reinvented. We need to learn the laws and statutes and the ways of God. And observe them. Instead of trying to take our own brand of whatever into a church. For instance, women. A strapless, shoulderless mini dress is not appropriate for church. And you may be thinking, oh, you're bringing style into the church. No, you're just trying to bring the world into the church. And they're not supposed to have communion one with another. God does not need you to reinvent him. He invented you, not the other way around. The clay doesn't have any say so in what the potter does. Of course, the church you go to should be power powerful enough to win you over and cast out that worldly spirit. But it depends on the church. God likes things decently and in order. So back to Malachi 1. And this chapter, as I said, is all about unacceptable offerings to God, making room for the devil. Because if the devil comes in, he's going to try to interrupt your, the flow of blessings to you. The flow that God has promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the covenants that he made with them and renewed with them. They should also be yours. They should also be mine. But God can't get to us to bless us if his altars are desecrated or profaned or defiled or if we're bringing shoddy offerings and sacrifices. And then just as Jesus came into Jerusalem and he wept over the city because they couldn't discern, this is Luke 19, they couldn't discern the time of their visitation. The time of our visitation is at the altar. Or when we are seeking the face of God and we're bringing uh, offerings of sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and worship and honoring him. And we're bringing a godly seed. Might as well put that in. And then the presence of the Lord and his angelic host is there ascending and descending as it were as Jacob saw it on this ladder to bring the blessings of Abraham into our lives. So Jesus is not there weeping again because we're missing the things he said that were for our peace. And these things are healing when we have enough, 
when we have health, when we have healing and we have joy in our life. We have the peace of God that passes all understanding. But then there are evil altars, evil idolatrous altars. They're all over the place in the Old Testament. And that's why we have to choose who we're going to serve because the default in the earth is already in place. And the default is the devil. He is the little G God of this world. For according to the number of your cities, this is God talking in Jeremiah eleven thirteen. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to the shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. We have to choose who we're going to serve. Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So we choose which altar we're going to be worshiping at. We choose by the intent of our hearts. We choose by our words. We choose by our actions, including our, our steadfastness. And we so did our parents and our grandparents. And that's why there are altars working in our lives today that we need to be aware of, that we need to discern, and that we need to look and see what's happening in our lives spiritually, what is happening in the spirit. Because if we don't, we're just going to go along, just, you know, whatever goes, whatever is coming to us, that's what we accept. But we don't have to do that. That's why we have the whole armor of God. That's why we have spiritual warfare. That's why we have prayer. We can change, change things. We are supposed to be receiving the blessings of Abraham. Now, I want us to know that literally we're not going to go out with a jackhammer and a big sledgehammer and break up things, idols and, and, and altars and things. This is all spiritual warfare I'm talking about. Amen. So altars can bless and altars can curse. Evil altars curse. Altars can speak positively or evil altars speak negatively in our presence or in our absence because of the spirits that are attached or associated with the altar. Altars, evil altars project generational curses and altars speak because of sacrifices. And these sacrifices are being offered to demons at this evil altar. And that comes with spiritual and legal argument, uh, agreements and covenants. And this is where things really go foul and seem to surprise a lot of people. Because you can never pay the devil back. Because if a sacrifice has been made to begin this evil covenant, that's not enough. That's like a down payment as far as the devil's concerned because the devil demands regular sacrifices and they are even upped and upped more and more is required because anything you get from the devil costs you everything. And if only man would realize that he's going to the person, the entity that caused the problem that he's trying to get the solution for in the first place, he's going to the person that caused the problem. Talk about being deceived. We get our blessings from God, not from some back alley and not from some magic potion. But this evil human agent is working this altar. They know this already. They know that it's going to be a greater and greater demand for sacrifice or they're going to soon find it out. They're going to the devil's going to want more and more and more. And this is how the devil gets into your generations. Because if you don't have enough to pay, even in your whole lifetime, you don't even make enough to pay him back what he wants. He'll wait. He's patient, isn't he? He'll wait. He'll wait for your children and your children's children. So I'm just reviewing that altars are the unseen doors to the spirit realm. And if man really knew how powerful he was, he would choose every word, every action, every step that he makes, every syllable out of his mouth. Because these words that he's choosing with his intent and his mouth speaking out of the abundance of his heart is creating and deepening and intensifying. Possibly it could be renewing evil covenants from evil altars. And that could be why life isn't working out for some folks. Evil altars. So if a family or a person is not aware that their altar is working in their lives, that probably means they haven't chosen one. They're just on default. Because if you don't choose one, one will be chosen for you. As I said, Satan is the little G God of this world. So that's the altar you're going to get. You're going to get an evil altar if you don't choose God. So 
in life, if you don't choose, a whole lot of stuff is just chosen for you. But a lot of stuff comes at you, too. Let's say you're watching TV and you look at all of the advertisements that come up on TV and you just decide, oh, I want everything I see. So you just order all of it. Of course, you're not going to do that. But letting the devil pick what's going to come to you is the same as just letting anything, just everything come at you. Or let's say you get a subscription for something, I don't know, a magazine or some uh, type of warranty service. And it says if you don't cancel it by a certain date, then it's going to renew automatically. If you don't want it renewed, you've got to do something. Evil covenants are like that. Evil altars are like that. You're going to have to do something if you don't want that thing automatically renewed because it will be automatically renewed. So we have to choose this day, blessings or cursings, who we're going to serve. We need to discern the patterns of our life. We need to just look and see, is an evil altar possibly working in our life? And we got to pray and break up the evil altars and break up the control it has over us. And we have to do it with intent and passion. And if you don't choose whatever you just randomly do in your life, whatever you do, what you spend your time on, your money on, your passion on, your life on, your energy on, that's what you're choosing. And as a child, when you come here, you don't have a choice. You get the altar that your parents are, are serving at. But as you get older, you have to choose. You get to choose. So you can't help what you're born into other than by prayer. And whatever your family believes in, what they participate in or what they don't participate in, that's what you will or won't do. That's the altar that you're going to be worshiping at. If it's not God's altar and you think that's working for you, then OK, then you stick with that. I mean, maybe you're oblivious to it or you're ignorant that you can change it, that you can have the blessings of Abraham. Don't just say it is what it is. Status quo. You can change it by prayer and your covenant relationship with God. And if what your parents had or something like it is good, good enough for you, then you go with that. But if you want something better, something more, something godlier, then you have to seek the face of God. Because in your, your being, I want to say this, in your being, you are not really separate from your parents, your grandparents, your forefathers. God looks at your bloodline as one, one unit. It's a bloodline. So you have to work with what you're given, try to improve on what you have, and you can go back and repent for your ancestors. You can do that. God allows you to do that. And you ask God to forgive the sins in your family line, to cleanse iniquity from your bloodline. Amen. That's another whole message. Deep subject. But there's an altar because it is the interface between what is seen and what what is not seen let it be done on earth as it is in heaven so things god creates is nothing new under the sun so god creates new things in heaven and he wants to bring these blessings to you they need to come to earth so i ask you what are your family's altars what are the altars of your family again it's any place you worship anything you worship with intensity or regularity and what are the idols in your family? Don't know. Flesh, money, sex, individuals, people, any and all the things that you have excessive pride in, your appearance, your look, your hair, makeup, beauty, strength, anything that comes before God is an idol. Cars, houses, your intelligence, education, career, achievements, work, sports, can't go to church on Sunday because you gotta watch sports. You got sports idols, music idols, you have to look at the patterns in your life. Is what you are doing, is what your family doing working out for you? Are you receiving the blessings of Abraham? Or are you receiving curses in your family line? Then you need to know if you need to make a change or not. I think that's called spiritual mapping. I call it Sherlocking. It's when you investigate some stuff. And you go looking into the lives of your family members, your parents, your relatives. And if what you're seeing and getting are blessings and your family's receiving from a godly altar, amen, hallelujah. But if you're getting hardship, setbacks, poverty, disease, illness, barrenness, divorce, death, and you got to know the signs. You know, I remember being a baby Christian. I, 
I only wanted to read about the blessings in Deuteronomy 28. I skipped right over the cursings. I decided, oh, that didn't apply to me. They're for the bad people. Hmm. Yeah, you keep on living. You need to know the signs because Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem because they had missed the spiritual significance of what was happening right in front of their faces. And that's what your life is showing you. It is showing you the spiritual significance of what is what your life is showing you is what is happening in the spirit. And if you know what's happening in the spirit, you know whether to celebrate it, embrace it. Or you know you need to do something about it to change it in the name of Jesus. Because if you miss the spiritual significances, the nuances and the patterns of your life, a person may not ever get saved. They may not ever pray. They may not ever break down one evil altar. They may not live a victorious life and they may not make it to heaven. Jesus wept. So how many family, how are the family altars built? As I said, they're whatever you spend your time, your energy, your money, your words, your life, your, your actions on. Sometimes it's trial and error. Sometimes you, we do make mistakes. And but we repent quickly. And anything that you do as a sacrifice or anything you give as a sacrifice. That is going to evoke either an evil presence or a godly presence depends on your intent what altar you're at and what that offering is because the altar is the interface between the seen and the unseen between the visible and the invisible so when you look out across a blue ocean for example at at some place the ocean is going to stop and then the sky which is also blue appears to start right and you can touch and feel the ocean but you cannot tangibly touch the sky the ocean you can see, the sky is clear in a sense, although it appears blue. So this is that interface between the seen and the unseen. This is the interface between the visible and the invisible. This is an altar. And it's the thing that's like the horizon. No, it's not a horizon. I'm not saying that the horizon is an altar. I'm saying that it is the interface between what you can touch and what you can't touch. Angels ascending and descending, bringing from heaven those blessings of Abraham into the natural for our natural use because we're natural beings. We're spirit beings in a flesh body. So an altar can be seen or an altar can be unseen. In the year that um, the King Hezekiah died, King Uzziah died, excuse me, the prophet said he saw God high and lifted up. So he saw a vision. He saw the altar, the throne of God which is the ultimate altar. The throne of grace is the ultimate godly altar. It's where we want to reach. It's where we pray. It's where we go for help in times of trouble, for grace and mercy. That is the ultimate godly altar. Amen. And then there's the devil has unseen altars too, altars of darkness. And they're in the second heavens, as well as in the ocean, the sea, in the wind, in the rocks, in the hillsides, in the mountains, in the ground, in the trees, in the forest, in the graves, in the land, all over the place, as I said. And the mother of all evil altars is the altar of sin and iniquity. But if we had spiritual eyes, we could see what's happening on evil altars. Well, or we can just wait and see the pattern of it when it reaches our natural life. Whenever any tragedy occurs, it's the work of an evil altar. Except for, I said, the counterfeit fake blessings, but they are only temporary just to deceive. Usually nothing comes out of an evil altar except wickedness and evil. And then this altar reflects back or projects back the result of what was put on it. And it's going to draw more good if it's a good altar or more evil. And all of these different offerings, they renew and intensify the covenants. So what does this altar look like? I don't know. It could look like anything. It could look like decor. You could go in somebody's house. They could have an altar and you don't even know it. You got to find out what altar people are worshiping at. And maybe you find out by the patterns in their lives. Or you find out if your life goes down when you're hanging out with them. Or if your life goes up when you're hanging with them. 
It could look like an art installation or it could look like an altar with candles and symbolic figurines and, and items on it. An evil altar could look like the wall of a serial madman's house where he's covered it in pictures of his latest obsession. An altar could look like the vision board of a person who desperately wants to get married at any cost. It could be, an altar could be the place that the person worships at, or it could be the thing that they actually worship. And this is one of the reasons God says don't make a graven image. Because man is made to worship. He has a tendency to worship. And if he's not discerning, he's going to worship either what's ever placed in front of him or whatever he thinks is good out of his own imagination, out of his own mind, if he doesn't have any godly teaching. An altar could be inside or outside, as we talked about. It could be high up. It could be ground level. It could be in the water. It could be stationary or mobile. It could be a building, a car, a person. It could be an altar, anything. And you need to look at what is an altar or listen to what is an altar. Or that's on this channel as well for a whole lot more information on this. But an altar could be, as I said, invisible. It could be nothing at all. It could be a space. It could be a place where worship and incantations are made, where sacrifices, blood or summonsing is made. An evil altar is a place where evil covenants are established. It's a place where agreements are reached for evil purposes. It's a place where evil people enter into covenant with wicked spirits. And every problem of man starts with an evil altar. Every single problem. So evil altars are attended to by evil priests and an evil priest is going to size you up, size me up and figure out what they're going to do against you or to you or if they're going to do anything at all. You see, because a witch is very powerful when unopposed, but if they look at you and they say you're not going to do anything because you don't even believe in witches, you don't believe in dark arts, you don't believe there's a spirit world, you don't believe in God, you don't believe... You do believe in God, but you're prayerless and careless, worshipless, praiseless, offeringless. Oh, you're the perfect candidate. Whatever you have that they want, they can just steal it right out from under you. If you're an unbeliever, you're a candidate. If you're backslidden, you're a candidate. If you're prayerless and careless, you're a candidate. You have, don't have any word in you, you're a candidate. If you're in the church and you're just in there and you're just faking it, you're just lukewarm. You know what I call a low-key Christian. More messages on that on this channel. You're the ideal candidate. But if they size you up and find out that you're on fire for the Lord, you're way into the word. You pray and you worship, you fast, you go to church and you're positively in the kingdom of God. They've got better sense than to touch God's anointed. They'll usually pass right by you because they know they can't touch you. And they would rather not try to touch you. They would rather not try to lay a hand on you than to touch God's anointed. Because they know if they do, God and his warring angels and the blood of Jesus will answer for you. So I am talking here about evil altars. About usually the jealous people who work them or hire people to hire evil human agents to work these evil altars against others maybe even against you we pray not and if not resisted this could be the start of the automatic generational stuff that's been in and can be in a bloodline for centuries some of the stuff could even be territorial just based on the town you live in the state you live in the nation you live in but there are personal level altars town altars city altars state even national altars evil altars set up to try to rule the world that's what the devil's trying to do satan little g god of this world always campaigning to try to take souls to hell to steal kill and destroy even those who profess god but they don't have fire in their walk with god you need to be hot for the lord you need fire you need word in you prayer in you worship praise and you give proper sacrifices unto God. Amen. And so if there's generational evil altar, if there's a generational evil altar working against you, you got to challenge it. And you got to come up against it in order to be delivered from it, from the suffering. And you got to serve God properly. 
not be deceived by the devil and not be taken to hell. Yeah, I said that because a whole family, a whole town, a city, a nation can be captured by evil altars if they don't do anything about it. All of us have to practice warfare against evil altars. It's a fact of life. Did you know that a person's whole life can be deposited on an evil altar? His marriage, his education, his certificates, his health, his children, his peace, his joy, tangibles and intangibles. It can all be deposited on an evil altar if it's unopposed. Altars can control, evil altars can control the destinies of people. An evil altar is going to work against a person. And don't think, none of us should think that we can just go from altar to altar. You can't say, okay, well today what altar, altar are you serving? What altar are you worshiping at today? God is not mocked. Because out of the same mouth come blessings and cursings. God is not the author of confusion. Just because a person is confused doesn't mean they're going to confuse God. It's not going to happen. And God said, build me an altar here. He said, sacrifice thus and so with intent. And this thing, the thing being sacrificed doesn't know what it's going to draw. It is the intent of the man or the woman that is bringing this sacrifice as to what will be drawn to that altar and what altar they're taking it to. And the intent is made known by those words. And out of your mouth should come blessings, not cursings. Amen. And the words we speak, they are spirit and they are life. Prayers to God is what we should be speaking, not evil incantations. And this is why all of us have to watch our words because altars exist. Whether we are aware of them or not, whether we believe in them or not, they exist. And adding our words either intensifies or creates intent that will summons either good or evil, depending on what was just said. Ezekiel 43, 8 and 9, they put their idols, their idol altars right next to mine with only a wall between them and me. They defiled my holy name by such detestable sin. So I consumed them in my anger. Now let them stop worshiping other gods and honoring the relics of their kings. And I will live among them forever. God is not playing with us. Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 41, this is the table that is before the Lord. Since it has been clarified that the altar is the Lord's table, then it is an abomination for anyone to share in both the Lord's table and the table of demons, therefore becoming partners with them. You got to make a choice. You can't serve one day at one and another day at another. That's another whole message too. So I review how long will an altar be in operation? Depends. Probably generations. You know, when you light your grill and you put your charcoals on it, it is hot until the last ember goes out. And as long as somebody's feeding that altar, giving sacrifices on that altar, working that altar, it's going to stay alive. It's going to keep working. And you can't presuppose that your family has no altars, that you're neutral. You got to find out what your altars are. And you find out by the fruit of what comes out of your family. You ask God, then you tear down all the evil altars whether you know their names or not, because altars can be working remotely against you too. There's charms and beads and animal altars and chaplets. People can put altars in their pockets and carry them around with them. Fingers, rings on their wrist. It can be hanged and moved from place to place. Altars, especially evil altars, they're, all, they're in all kinds of places, not just in buildings. They're in the sky, astral, tree, forest. Pot, cauldron. We talked about some of these. I also want to recommend another message. Don't give them money. That's on this channel. So you may not even go to an evil altar. And your ancestor may not have gone to an evil altar. But were they in alliance with someone who did? Did they share their money, the fruit of their labor, their energy, their time with someone who did go to an evil altar or served at an evil altar? That made a covenant. That's affecting your bloodline and that altar could be projecting into your life. Now we are going to pray. You could be in a collective captivity with your whole family. And if you're dreaming of your family home a lot, 
we're going to pray because we're going to need to pray ourselves out of family altars. We're going to have to pray fervently for deliverance from any evil altar. If we dream of ourselves in frustration dreams, like taking exams, same exams over and over again, we're going to pray. If we feel like we're in bondage and at the edge of a breakthrough, we just can't get the whole breakthrough, we're going to pray. Marriage troubles, can't even achieve just normal things in life, we're going to pray. We get partial breakthroughs or there's financial troubles or we can't get satisfaction or we have repeated problems, we are going to pray. We're going to pray for deliverance from evil altars. And we're going to make sure that we do repent and confess and forsake all of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we're going to repent from constructing evil altars if we're guilty of that. We're going to repent on behalf of our ancestors. We're going to renounce and break every covenant of every evil altar. We're going to release our destinies and our lives from evil altars in the name of Jesus. And then we're going to ask for release of our blessings from evil altars. And then we pray to recover all that we've lost in the evil altars in the name of Jesus. Because we can defeat and break up and cast down evil altars in the name of Jesus. With the word of God, with the sword of the Lord, with the Holy Ghost fire, the thunder hammer of God and the weapons of God's warfare. Amen. If we keep getting the same results, then we need to build a new altar or repair the altar that's been broken or defiled or, or desecrated. And we repent with a contrite heart. We come with brokenness before the Lord. We bring something of value. We're, even if it's ourselves, a living sacrifice, we offer praise and worship. And we offer our prayers and then we give an offering, a seed, prophetic decrees and blessings. And we must keep the altar of God holy so we can keep covenant with God. And so we don't defile the altar of God. So when we ask, God will erase satanic covenants that are spiritually waging war against mankind. I need God. I'll build an altar. I'll raise an altar. I met God. I will build an altar. Jacob did. God revealed himself to me in a new way. I'll build an altar. I'm thankful for what God has done for me. I'll build an altar. And when we look back over our lives, we should see altars like stepping stones through our lives. Altars that memorialize blessings. Altars that are thanksgiving altars and praise altars. Altars that have invited the presence of God and his mighty angels into our lives. Altars that work and continue working throughout our lives, throughout our generations, to the third and fourth generations of our bloodlines and beyond. God said, erect an altar to me here. And sometimes that altar is praise. Sometimes it's worship. Many times it's prayer. Lord, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Lord, you've kept me, you've blessed me, you fought for me, you saved me, you loved me, and you made my name great in the earth, and the gates of hell have not prevailed against me. And when I was in sin, you picked me up and cleaned me up. And then we go from grace to grace, from strength to strength, and from altar to altar, if they're godly altars. We must break all evil covenants in the name of Jesus. Lord, I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. Oh Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, I use the name and the blood of Jesus Christ to separate myself and my family members from satanic, demonic, occultic, marine and witchcraft altars that are active or operating in our fathers, mothers, wives, or husbands foundation in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I release the fire of God upon every foundational, ancestral and family altar where the umbilical cords, hairs, body parts and or garments of myself and my family members have been kept for evil purposes in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I use the name and blood of Jesus Christ to bind and paralyze evil and demonic spirits that dwell on the earth and that are assigned to hinder me and my family members in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I use the name and blood of Jesus Christ 
to destroy and nullify demonic or satanic agreements between rulers of darkness in high places and occultic or demonic forces of the earth fashioned against me and my family members in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I use the name and blood of Jesus Christ to destroy and nullify evil agreements between marine spirits and demonic forces of the earth fashioned against me and my family members in Jesus' name. Amen. I release myself from any inherited evil altars in the name of Jesus. I break every evil altar with a thunder hammer of God and command every evil priest to scatter in the name of Jesus. Every effect of parental curses, envious rivalry, dream pollution, demonic initiations, family idols, evil dedication, demonic marriage, demonic sacrifice, evil laying on of hands, destructive effects of polygamy i break all associated curses and release myself from all of this in the name of jesus any evil covenant on evil altars of my foundation break by the fire of god in the name of jesus ancestral covenant in evil altars controlling my life break by the blood of jesus in jesus's name you evil covenant that has brought poverty into the family break and release your captives in the name of jesus i break all sexual covenants on evil altars of familiar spirits or spirit husband spirit wife in the name of jesus evil arrows from every evil altar i command you i'm not your target back to sender in the name of jesus any evil covenant on evil altars of my foundation break by the fire of God in the name of Jesus. Ancestral covenant and evil altars controlling my life break by the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. By the blood of Jesus, I break any evil covenant on evil altars containing my destiny in the name of Jesus. My destiny shine, arise and shine for me to the glory of God in the name of Jesus ancestral covenant on evil altars that has captured the whole family break by fire in the name of jesus covenant keeping god break any evil covenant attached to my ministry in the name of jesus you stronghold covenant of evil altars in my foundation break by the holy ghost fire in Jesus' name i loose myself from any evil altar by the fire of god in Jesus' name covenants on evil altars catch fire and burn to ashes in the name of jesus Holy Ghost fire, break up every territorial altar. Receive Holy Ghost fire right now and burn to ashes in the name of Jesus. Altars in my father's house, eat the Holy Ghost fire and be destroyed in Jesus' name. Altars in my mother's house, eat the Holy Ghost fire and be destroyed in the name of Jesus. Altars in relatives' houses, friends' houses, enemies' houses, unfriendly friends' houses, exes, in-laws, former in-laws' houses, evil co-workers, competitors, eat the Holy Ghost fire and be destroyed in Jesus' name. I recover my virtues from every evil altar by the Holy Ghost fire in Jesus' name. Oh God, take me out of every evil altar cage in the name of Jesus. Give me wings of the eagle in the name of Jesus. I withdraw my virtues from every evil altar of my foundation in Jesus' name. My business and finances come out from every evil altar of witchcraft in Jesus' name. I withdraw my name, image, likeness from any evil altar that I've been initiated to in the name of Jesus. Any evil altar programming poverty upon my life, I withdraw my prosperity out from you in the name of Jesus. Any ancestral evil altar holding me captive, release me and die in the name of Jesus. Every satanic altar crying against my destiny, be confused and be destroyed by fire in the name of Jesus. Every satanic evil altar that has captured my soul, spirit and or body, be confused and destroyed, let me go in Jesus' name. I withdraw every part of my body from every evil altar in Jesus' name. Every evil manipulation from the witchcraft kingdom backfire by fire in Jesus' name. Any evil manipulation that has been fired into the life of the ministers backfire in the name of Jesus. Any manipulation from the strong man in my father's and mother's house backfire in Jesus' name. Any manipulation from the strong man of my relatives' houses, my friends, enemies, unfriendly friends, competitors, in-laws, former in-laws, exes, etc. Somersault and die in the name of Jesus. 
Every evil altar mark inherited from my foundation be blotted out and washed away by the blood of Jesus in Jesus' name. You, the marks of evil altars in my life disappear in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, arise and clean all marks of evil altars, sponsoring poverty in my life in Jesus' name. O oh Lord God of my fathers, come out by your mercy and deliver me from foundational evil altar marks in Jesus' name. Every evil altar mark of marital delay in my destiny die in the name of Jesus. Lord, put me in the right place at the right time so I do not miss any godly visitations. Give me discernment to see patterns in my life and Holy Spirit, help me to pray and break all ungodly alliances, contracts, covenants, curses sooner than later in the name of Jesus. And Father, remove the iniquity from me and my bloodline in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I command the Holy Ghost fire to destroy any demonic, satanic or occultic altar of darkness fashioned against the blessings of my family and myself in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I command the angels of God to overthrow and destroy demonic, satanic or occultic altars of of seven that have been erected against the blessing of myself and my family members in Jesus' name, amen. Oh Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I decree and declare that demonic, satanic, or evil altars erected to the host of heaven meant to hinder the well being of myself and my family members are destroyed by the angels of God in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I decree and declare that any demonic, satanic or evil priest that will ever be hired to curse me and my family members before their altars will never succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I will forever bless your name because voices in demonic or satanic altars of darkness will never understand my future or destiny or those of my family members in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh Lord, my God, my Redeemer and Savior, I will forever bless your name because Jesus Christ is the high priest of myself and my family members. And the cross of Jesus Christ as a powerful altar will forever speak in our favor in Jesus' name. Amen.